Good evening, buenas noches, bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Alberto Hernández, soy el director del Centro de Estudios um, Estudio Puertorriqueños de la Biblioteca de Archivo. My name is Alberto Hernández, I'm the Chief Librarian for the Library and Archives. We welcome you tonight. Uh, we have our first um, historical preservation of the season. Tonight we have a program that Nielsen has en entitled El Amor Entra por la Cocina, Cooking and Cultural Identity Amongst Puerto Rican Women Living in New York City in New York State. Um, the Historical Preservation and Research Partnership Program was created in the summer of 2009 to bring collaborations between independent researchers and Centro to unearth the stories behind the Puerto Rican communities in the USA in all its endeavors and disciplines. Now in the fourth round of, of proposal, we have awarded over 20 grants and projects ranging from history to religion and music and cookery. Tonight we have a presentation based on one of these projects, a partnership between CIA's Nilsa Rodriguez Haka from the Culinary Institute and Centro, and she will be speaking about culinary traditions in the Puerto Rican diaspora. Um, we also have guest Debbie Quinones and a chef Julio Rodriguez with us. <laughs> to say something about uh, Nilsa, Dr. Rodriguez Haka, she's a professor of food culture in Spain and Latin America and foreign languages at the CIA. That's the Culinary Institute of America, located in High Park, in High Park upstate. Among her academic background, she has a PhD and MA from State University of New York at Albany. She has advanced doctoral coursework from the Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas in Spain and also University of Puerto Rico. As a teacher, she's taught at SUNY New Platz, American University of San Juan, Union College in Schenectady, and also at SUNY Albany. She's a recipient of the Curso Superior de Investigaciones Científicas Award of 1994, and also graduate fellow at SUNY Albany from 1993 to 1996. Among her professional uh, memberships included are the Modern Language Association, Latin American Studies Association, Puerto Rican Studies Association, and the Association for the Study of Food and Culture. Please welcome Nilsa Rodriguez Haga. Good afternoon. How are you all doing today? Good. Good. Um, I would like to uh, begin this presentation by giving thanks to many people that have made this first part of the project possible. I would first would like to uh, thank Alberto, uh, Dr. Alberto Hernandez Manucci, who's the director of the Central Library and Archives, uh, for his unwavering support from the beginning to the end of this part of the project, uh, and also to the Central uh, Committee that works with historical preservation uh, for granting me a grant to conduct the first round of interviews. I would also like to thank Mary Munet Plaza, who was the videographer and photographer that worked with me during the interviews. Um, I also would like to thank culinary anthropologists and folklorists, uh, Dr. Polly Adama, who's a good friend of mine, uh, for her helpful advices on how to conduct ethnographic research and also how to select the best questions for interviews. I'm not trained as an anthropologist, uh, I am training literature and cultural studies, so I have to solicit help, and she was rather generous with her advices so I could do this ethnographic research. I also would like to thank, as we are calling you, Debbie, uh, the Coquito Contesa, Debbie Quinones, um, for uh, putting me in contact with Maria Munoz, uh, who helped me um, connect with a group of women who I was able to interview also. I want to thank Maria Solis for that work. And especially, I would like to thank Cecilia Hernandez, Maria Solis, Modesta Febo, Odilia de Jesus, uh, Olga Quiñones, Montserrat Pagan, Josefina Maldonado, Emilia Martinez, Raquel Rodriguez, and finally, Debbie Quiñones, uh, for their generosity and kindness uh, and for agreeing uh, to the interviews. Uh, the main goal of my project is to gather information and primary resources that have to do with the culinary traditions of the Puerto Rican diaspora. Uh, to be able to um, do this first part of the project, I prepare a questionnaire and I ask questions regarding migration. For example, when did you arrive in New York or why did you come to the United States or come to New York? I also ask questions about where food was purchased who cooked the food, who cleaned after meals, 
and how religions influence consumption, especially during the Holy Week. Um, I conducted 12 interviews, and the women's age range from 38. One of them was 38 years old, and um, the other one was in her early 50s. But most of them were between 62 and 92 years old. I have an interview here with Doña Maria, and she is 92 years old. Uh, I used the transcripts and the video recording uh, to look for common themes that have to do with food consumption. And not only food consumption by itself, but how this food consumption helped this woman maintain a sense of community and identity uh, for many decades here in New York. Um, how did I become interested in this uh, topic? Uh, the idea of doing this project on culinary traditions of the Puerto Rican diaspora was born out of my own interest in cultural studies, specifically post-colonial theory, and how religion, food, gender, and the socio-political discourse of the dominating class influence identity and the culture of those that live under a colonial power. Although there is a growing body of knowledge on Latinos in the United States, there is unfortunately not much research being conducted on how Puerto Ricans who migrated to New York have kept the traditions alive through food. As we speak, we are at risk of losing valuable historical information because older members of our community are aging and dying. And they have maintained a sense of community and cultural pride uh, that must be conserved and kept for the younger generations. Traditionally, food has not been an acceptable topic of research in academic circles. Food was something to be consumed, but it was not worth of intellectual inquiry or scholarly work. This perception began to change with the introduction of cultural studies in the mid-90s, and especially with the publication of Food and Culture, an interdisciplinary collection of essays edited by Carl Cunningham and Peggy Van Esterick in 1997. Few years later, the field of food studies was established. It was followed by a growing interest in the fields of gastronomy, global studies and immigration, and most recently, culinary tourism. We are now looking at cooking practices around the world, the preservation of culinary traditions in the face of globalization, the redefinition of authenticity, and how to save flavors and cooking methods from around the world. It's not only with the Puerto Rican community, but these global changes are happening all over the world. Through the practice of cooking, the women that I interviewed have transmitted gender roles and rules, family traditions and recipes. Now, let's not forget the phrase that we all grew up hearing, el amor entra por la cocina or love begins or starts in the kitchen. Culturally speaking, women are expected to transmit their love for their family through cooking. Food also make possible an intimate connection with the past when women share family recipes and cooking methods with the younger generation. Learning how to cook became a rite of passage for young Puerto Rican girls who were introduced to the art of cooking when they were around the age of 13 or as we say in Puerto Rico still, when they were senoritas. In Latin America, food has been used by the ruling class to dominate and control the food consumption of the lower class. Until recently, maize was viewed in Mexico as a contributing factor to peasants' backwardness and lack of nutrition, while wheat consumption was viewed as a sign of an advanced and healthy society. This Eurocentric view of maize ended when scientific research showed that maize, combined with other native crops, had all the vitamins, minerals, and amino acids needed for a sustainable, healthy diet. In this project, I learned that food, food consumption also reflects religious traditions. Meat was not eaten during the Holy Week, as we all know, especially on Good Friday, because Catholicism forbids its consumption. According to Cecilia, her family cook with coconut milk in Holy Thursday instead of using lard. On Good Friday, a day of fasting and religious obligation, her family spent, spent most of the day in church. When they returned to their homes, they ate the meat they cooked the day before. 
¿Y qué comían en la Semana Santa o qué no comían en la Semana Santa? En la Semana Santa solo no ponían a comer carne. No Porque comían lo que comían era pescado. Este, pescado, cualquier clase de pescado, sardinas, comían, ¿no? salmón, este, camarones. Si sí, había dinero para comer una langostita, dos langostitas, pues se compraban. Pero era una cosa que, que comían una langosta todos los días, porque en realidad, pues, tú sabes, no, era, no, no teníamos bastante dinero para estar comprando, ¿tú entiendes? Pero cuando pues, aparecía para la langosta, pues comían una sala de langosta. Para la Semana Santa. Para la Semana Santa. Y ustedes, porque yo sé que alguna gente que celebra la Semana Santa y antes, durante la cuaresma, no comen carne. No se come carne, los viernes. No, no los viernes no comían carne. Los viernes se comía este, lo que mi mamá decía alguna vez en Marifinca, que era harina de maíz con bacalá. Quizá. Marifinca y eso. Marifinca. Es? es la harina de maíz con bacalá. ¿Y se mezclaban juntos? Sí, sí, se mezclan juntos. Y, y es bien bueno. Es bien bueno. ¿Usted sabe cómo hacerlo? Sí. ¿Y cómo se hace la marifinga? La marifinga, pues tú haces la harina de maíz como cualquier harina de maíz. El bacalao tú lo, lo haces como cualquier bacalao guisado. Y entonces lo une. Entonces lo cocina por lo, separado. Sí, lo, lo cocina por separado y después lo cocina. Lo, lo, lo une. Qué bien. ¿Lo une en frío o caliente? No, ahí caliente se une porque tú te lo comes caliente. Es como una comida. Ah, qué bien. Interesante. Yo eso nunca lo había escuchado. Le decía Marifinga. Marifinga. <risa> um, ¿Había algún tipo de comida que ustedes no comieran? Bueno, me dijo que no comían eh, carne. No, no, no. ¿Y por qué no, eso de por qué no se come carne en la Semana Santa? Porque este, la religión católica... That was Cecilia talking about Marifinga, which I didn't even know it existed until I interviewed her. Were you familiar with Marifinga? Yes. We call it uh, Funche. We call Funche. 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 Funche, that's what it is. Con bacalao, right. And it's an African dish. That's what it is. That makes sense. So let me conclude uh, my presentation so my uh, panelists can also share their experiences with food. Um, I learned with this project that, of course, what we already knew, women did most of the cooking at home. Uh, they also did most of the cleaning after the meals. And with few exceptions, uh, there were children that would help um, these Puerto Rican women to do the cleanup. Now, when it came to grocery shopping, uh, this was a little bit surprising, surprising for me to learn that uh, in many cases, men were the ones that did grocery shopping. And it was because Either they manage the income in the household or because for convenient re convenience reasons. Bags are heavy to carry around, so they will do the groceries and carry them home instead of having the wives carrying the bags. Um, now, where did people purchase the food? I learned that many times they purchase the food in La Marqueta. Why La Marqueta? Because that's where they found traditional foods such as panas, yautillas, av avocados, avocates and mangoes, which now can be found anywhere pretty much, but not 40 or 50 years ago. Uh, other women bought their foods in bodegas or in supermarkets or whatever they could find the best prices, but going to La Bodega was a very common practice back then. According to one of the interviewees, uh, she was able to buy Puerto Rican foods in the city as early as 1950s or the early 50s although the quality was not always the best and prices were, of course, higher than they were in the island. Puerto Rican women have for many years and many generations used cooking uh, as a marker of national identity and as a tool against the Americanization of the Puerto Rican appetite. In our matriarchal society, women hold an unspoken power and their place of command is often the kitchen, especially in the older times, not so much these days. The kitchen was the domain in which they prepared food to feed and nurture their families, even though many work whole days in the garment industry during the 1950s and 60s. Thank you. Good evening. Going into from one to the other. <clears throat> my name is Chef Julio Rodriguez. My name is Julio Rodriguez. I have to be a chef. I teach culinary arts now. I'm sort of retired. Uh, but I'm still working, uh, teaching, and I write books on the subject. And if you go to YouTube, you can check out my videos. I've got 10 of them on Caribbean cooking, and uh, we're going into a segment right now on uh, 
called Jamaican Me Crazy, which of course is on Jamaican cooking. We'll be doing four videos on things like jerk and uh, snappers and curries and what have you. Uh, basically what we're trying to do here today is to give you a background. So we're going to go back to the 1500s, uh, actually right during the time that Columbus uh, founded the New World, as they called it, the Caribbean. Uh, you have to remember that all the islands in the Caribbean were inhabited by Indians. Uh, they were not as they're known today. Uh, during the 1500s, uh, they found out that, well, they checked the islands and they said, fantastic place to grow things. You know, climate high, humidity high, it's sunny most of the time, rains a little bit part of the day, but then more sun. And the soil, in most cases, very fertile and great for growing things. We have a misconception on sugarcane because uh, what we think the sugarcane was here. It, most of the items that uh, are in the Caribbean today were actually brought to the Caribbean uh, during the time that the Indians were here, what they basically lived on was fish, vegetables that they grew, uh, some fruits, small birds, parrots, uh, whatever other birds were hanging around that uh, were not in the uh, meal for that evening. But mostly the uh, menu was fish and very light and of course the Indians were in excellent condition due to that type of uh, diet. From the time that uh, gold was discovered in the Caribbean, although there really wasn't that much, slaves were brought in uh, not only to dig, for, well, the, the, the Indians due to uh, diseases and hard labor, most of them either left the islands or just simply were decimated. Uh, the Africans were brought in as laborers, of course you know what they were actually uh, they were not laborers, they were slaves. They were brought in from that period from the 1500s on up. Now what happened during the 1500s to the 1700s, Spanish basically controlled the islands. After the 1700s, British took over a lot of the islands, most of them, except with exception to uh, the Spanish islands that Spain kept, which is Santo Domingo, uh, Cuba, and uh, Dominican Republic, which was part French, Haiti, and the other part Hispanic. The menus changed, the French came in, the Dutch came in, and spices were brought in from other parts of the world, especially India. Uh, during the uh, slavery period, once it ended, the slaves were given land. Some of them were growing vegetables, uh, they more or less fed themselves. Uh, when you, if you see a, a movie, Captain Bly, Mutiny on the Bounty, you'll see that on board ship they had brought back from some of the islands that they were visiting, uh, panapeng, which is breadfruit. You'll see the little uh, plants that they have, uh, seedlings, which get tossed overboard when the ship gets, goes into mutiny. Anyway, uh, a lot of these, a lot of the items that we do have today in the Caribbean there was no goats, there was no cows, there was no horses per se, there was no pork. All of these items were brought in. There was no wheat, garlic, onions, uh, a lot of the items that are used uh, in the Caribbean for cooking were actually brought in from the period of the uh, 1700s, 1800s. Uh, yeah. The Spanish left behind a fantastic product which was called Creole cooking, or co cocinando criollo, as we know it. Uh, the main item that was used there was sofrito. And there, there in Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, and Santo Domingo, sofrito is used extensively in cooking. And for those who uh, want to jot down the recipe for making sofrito very, <laughs> very quickly, uh, you have cilantro, culantro, which is the longer leaf, uh, hisitos, uh, a, t a tomato, some onion, pepper, actually you can use various peppers, they used to use hot peppers back in those days, more so than green peppers. Uh, chop all that up, mix it together or blend it, 
put it in your food and you'll get that distinct flavor known as Creole cooking or comida criollo. The other, the British uh, brought in a lot of items, especially today uh, you'll find that most of the differences in their cooking, the teas, the uh, biscuits, the jellies and chutneys were items that they contributed to the cooking. Uh, the slaves were, the laborers were then uh, the different uh, people that came in to replace them in many cases were Chinese. The Chinese, uh, a lot of them went to Cuba. Today in Cuba you have a certain eastern part which does extensive cooking in the Spanish Creole style. You have the western part which is Chinese influenced. The rice, the soups, uh, a lot of the items that are eaten in Cuba today have a Chinese influence. You go to Trinidad and Tobago, there the laborers that were brought in were from India. So you have the curries that were brought in. And this is an extensive area uh, in the uh, Caribbean where curries are used in the cooking. The Africans brought in uh, items like okra, kalalu, many spices, uh, many different styles of cooking also to the table. Uh, the kalalu is sort of a spinach type leaf that's used in soups and in making uh, vegetable products. Uh, I was reading something here that was very, that was, that was cute because uh, it speaks of the languages that some of these islands have. Uh, one of them is called, let's see, Papamiento. Pa, pa, okay, the language, especially in Aruba, the language is evolved from Spanish, Portuguese, Dutch, French, English, and African. <coughs> We, we have trouble with Spanglish. <laughs> can you imagine, you know, going to a place? Although they say that most Spanish people can understand uh, when they speak, you know. I'm, I'm staying in New York. Yeah, I'm in trouble. I go to Puerto Rico and I, I speak Spanish and my wife goes, so, 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 so. You know, that's another way. Uh, today I was looking at cassava. Cassava is used extensively throughout the Caribbean and parts of Asia. There uh, feeds over 500 million people, uh, so it's ex an extensive product. But then I'm, I'm looking and I'm saying, but cassava is juca, and juca is cassava. The funniest thing, yes, you could say that, but if you look at the plant, totally different. The, the, the actual plant that comes out it's different. The yuca is from the aguabe plant, which is a plant that's used extensively in Mexico for making uh, tequila, purgue. Uh, and it, you probably have some at home. It's that long stem that grows leaves. And there's usually two or three of them together. Uh, there's, they're in a lot of homes. Uh, that's the, the plant that comes out of the yuca. And it also flowers. If you look at the cassava, which is also basically yuca. Plant is eight leaves, seven, seven to eight leaves, and totally different. And I'm still, I have to go back to the computer tonight and, you know, find out what happened here. You know, were they crossed somewhere in time, or, you know, I have no idea. But the, uh, the item that we use a lot in Puerto Rican cooking or in, in general cooking in the Caribbean is rice and beans. Uh, Jamaicans call it peas and rice. And yet, oh, here's, here's another one, pigeon peas, gandules. I always thought that was a product of Goya from Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah. It's African. Okay, the gandules were brought here by Africans years ago. Uh, the uh, peas and rice in uh, Jamaica, which is used quite a lot throughout various islands, uh, the Jamaicans also use a product called aki and bacalao, or saltfish, extensively. They, 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 that product was also brought over from Africa years ago, uh, and it's in Jamaica, aki trees are all over the place. Aki and juca are both poisonous. 
if not prepared properly. This kid, the Aki, if you don't pick it while it's ripe and you try eating it, you could die. Seizures and uh, heart strokes and what is that when you surround? And so I guess this is some sort of seizure. The yuca or cassava, the same situation. If it, the skin should not be eaten and if it's not prepared properly, can also create problems with your heart and your nervous system. Don't worry about that. You just, you know, go ahead with it and eat the, just make sure that you peel it and boil it properly. Uh, the differences in the cuisines from island to island changes basically on the spice that's used in the island. I'm reading on uh, Grenada, they add cinnamon to their stews. Well, I would never do that. You know, if I'm making a sancocho, I don't want it to taste like cinnamon. But uh, yet their style, they do. Uh, I was reading that they also add tamarindo or tamarind to a lot of their uh, vegetables and stews. I could see it as a tea or uh, as a drink, but again, it's, it's, it's a sweetness. Uh, the Chinese brought the sour and the sweetness when they added raisins to food, uh, and it totally changed the style of cooking, but basically the Spanish style that was first introduced was kept. Rice and beans uh, in Haiti, in other islands, you'll see that they're constantly made a little different. Spices that they add could be different. If you have a rice and beans in a uh, Indian restaurant, you'll taste turmeric. You know, which is uh, God, it's used extensively in India. They produce eighty percent, hundred percent of it. They consume eighty percent of the turmeric that they produce for the world. So only twenty percent is divided among the world, and people use very little of it. I don't know if you've been to a uh, Indian home lately, but they don't have to be cooking. You walk in and you go, oh, curry. It's it's in the air. Yeah, it's in the air. It's all over the place. They basically cook with curry almost every day. What is curry? Curry is a mixture of spices. It's, there's no specific. Turmeric is a large spice that's used in curries, but they add other items, peppers, uh, mustard, uh, cum, uh, I was gonna say, uh, cor coriander. Uh, oh, they, they basically mix anywhere from 10 to 14 items to create that curry. All right, so it's, you, you shouldn't go around saying to a person, define curry. Very difficult to do, okay? And there's so many types of curries. Do we have any questions? The uh, foods that were imported to Puerto Rico, I know some came from Africa, India uh, as well, India? In Puerto Rico, not so much Indian products. Uh, the Indians basically were used as laborers in Trinidad, Tobago, and other islands. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of the people that live in the Caribbean today are African and they they had more of an influence on some of the vegetables and spices How that are brought like in. Mango? Where did that come from? You know that's a good question. These these fruits and vegetables that you have in the Caribbean mostly came from the East Indies, uh, regions like Maya, Mayan, uh, Indonesia, uh, items uh, Countries like Cambodia, uh, Asian countries produced most of the fruits and vegetables that are in the Caribbean today. Uh, yeah. No, also uh, the palm trees, because I was yeah. always fascinated. Yeah. I thought they just were there. They no, were they, not there when they they, they floated onto the island also from Asian countries. Uh, I if you'll you'll see that occasionally. You'll see a coconut with a little uh, sprout floating in the water. It more than likely came from one, the one island. Got to my house. Yeah, one, one, yeah, one showed up. One showed up in Co-op City in the Bronx. Is it that the poisonous foods end up becoming such a foundation in the food? You can't talk to a Jamaican and tell them not it's to if, it, It's if they're eaten unripened. Right. The the aki is like a pear when it's bad. It's green. Then it changes into an orange, yellow, and then it becomes a pinkish red. 
that's when it opens up and it reveals three little pots that are inside. Now it's ready to get picked. Uh, many people have used Aki that has fallen off the tree, not totally right, uh, and they've gotten quite sick because of it. Uh, and I don't know if you've tasted Aki, it's like eating scrambled eggs. Uh, it's very popular with, with uh, bacalao, used as a, a breakfast item. Uh, in, in the islands, breakfast is not eggs and bacon. It's basically uh, some form of bread, soup, or uh, stew. Uh, there are other islands where lunch is the heavy meal of the day. You have rice and beans, you have a meat product, uh, you have a soup product, and in the evening, lighter type meal. Uh, in, in many parts of Puerto Rico, the afternoon meal, uh, I used to remember I used to take uh, friambreras to my, there are little pots that are together. I used to take them to my father uh, out in the field. I used to eat at home before I left for that long trip. And then when I got there, he'd say, have you had lunch? No. <laughs> and my mother would say, this takes me back many years, a few years. My mother would send one with rice, one with bean, one with steak, with onion, maybe a salad. My father never ate the salad. But we would, we would eat that meal, and then we would both fall asleep under a tree for about two or three hours. I mean, you know, you, you can't eat like that all every day, and these people do. They actually consume a very large lunch. But they're out in the field. They were out in yeah. the field working hard. <laughs> yes, dear. My grandfather was a, a plumber. My grandmother stayed at home, and everybody in the family at one point or other stayed in the house. It, it passed through. I mean, uh, one of my grandmother's sisters had died and, and had five children, so, you know, they, they came, they came to, to live there. Um, but the, I went to Puerto Rico the first time when I was six years old. My sister was five years old. We lived in the Bronx, and we took this long trip to Puerto Rico, and I met my grandparents. But I never remember my grandmother being anywhere else but the kitchen. Mm -hmm. When we woke up, she was making hot chocolate for us, and she would make it with, you know, fresh, the, the grape, the, the chocolate, and, and, and made uh, some kind of breakfast for us. And then we would go out to play, but she then would start on that that big meal that she was going to prepare. Is this lunch or dinner? For lunch. For lunch. This is for lunch. And, and then, so we would have that big meal for lunch, and then we would go out to play again, and she was still in the kitchen. And then the dinner again in the evening, and at night she would prepare us a snack. But she was always in the kitchen. I yeah. never remember her in any other room. Oh, well, it's amazing how uh, most, uh, my, my favorite person in the kitchen is a, 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 a if I, if I could see a fat grandma in the kitchen, I'm eating in that restaurant. Okay, because I know the food's going to be good. Although the, al although the cooking was so difficult to work in restaurants that they left that job for the men uh, years ago. Uh, I have a book that my, this is my second book, Cooking Columbus. I named it after uh, Christopher. And it's a history of cooking in the Caribbean. Uh, you have 22 islands, although there are hundreds, actually there are about a thousand islands in the Caribbean, there are hundreds that are pretty large. There are 22 that are really, really uh, the ones that are in this book. Uh, we covered the history of each island from the point of contact with the Indians, so there are stories in here about the Tainos, the Arawaks, uh, the Caribs. Uh, you have paintings. I'm also an artist, so I, I, my son says to me, Dad, you, you do palm trees, so you should put palm trees in every chapter. I said to him, you know, it took me two years to get to this point. I had brown hair when I started this book. Uh, and he said, no, 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 you really should put uh, palm trees. So uh, actually, this is the one that you purchased. <laughs> it's, uh, it's in, every book is covered with a, uh, it starts out with a, uh, uh, painting. You have the native Indians of the Caribbean, the Simi, which is the uh, what they uh, would worship back then, slavery in the Caribbean, sugarcane, uh, spices of the Caribbean. I wrote six pages on spices. Uh, 
I found that you know there was so much to write about. My publisher says two, so I got rid of four. I had 500 pages on this book, and then they said 300, 300. So I had to get rid of t or incorporate 200. Uh, you have the chili pepper, roots and vegetables, pirates of the Caribbean, which is very important because pirates had a lot to do with the changing of the Caribbean. They went into they went in with the British to get rid of most of the Spanish. Uh, people, uh, uh, sailors that were ships that were around in those days, uh, which helped the uh, British to establish uh, the majority uh, of islands in the Caribbean. Uh, we have uh, islands from Antigua all the way to the Virgin Islands, and I do have some copies available if you want to pick up a uh, book later on. And yes? I have a question. Okay. Sure. Um, my family is also from Puerto Rico, and a lot of the um, the meals include olives and capers. Yes. And I'm assuming that's Spanish in origin. See. But I just wondered how unique that was. Is it, is it throughout the Caribbean, or is it pretty much? Worse no, than no, no. Caribbean? You'll find that uh, in many of the African islands, that's that product's not used at all. No, uh, no, no capers, uh, no olives. Uh, they have other items that they'll put in, and yet you'll find some islands that, that do use it, but basically uh, acaparado uh, are, are used in uh, Cuba extensively. Cuba also has a uh, Spain-type influence in their meals more than any other island, uh, more than Puerto Rico and more than Santo Domingo, so a lot of the products that were actually used in Spain came into uh, Cuba more so. You don't see it that much today because of the uh, embargo and the closing of the island that, uh, that basically for the last 30 to 40 years has kept that island in place. Uh, so the other islands have picked up where they left off. Uh, you have uh, Puerto Rican paella more so than anything. The Cubans make a paella. It's a little different. Uh, more of the Spanish style. The Santo Domingo the people use platanos extensively, uh, guineos uh, in their cooking. Uh, they make they make a sancocho, but they add just about everything but the kitchen sink into it. They have a seven seven meats sancocho, which is unreal. <laughs> We're setting up a sancocho party soon uh, at home. Where did the where the coco come from? Coconut. The coconuts were also uh, brought in. That, that was not a uh, product of the Caribbean. They also came from the Asian part of the world and, and Africa. Africa, uh, not, only, not only were items taken from Africa, items were brought to Africa, especially there was a period in, in the world during the 1700s where spices became gold. First it was sugar, sugar cane that became like the new gold, uh, because the the Europeans had a sweet tooth. But not only that, rum, rum became a product that they could take back to their islands and uh, to to their countries and sell and make a great profit. But right after that, what happened was spices. They uh, some somebody finally found the correct route that Columbus should have taken to get to the other side of the the Indies, which he thought. He had landed, you know, in the Caribbean. Big mistake. But once they opened up that route, spices then became the gold. Uh, and sugar cane, sugar cane is no longer a big deal that much in the Caribbean. Uh, now they're using sugar beet. Uh, they're, there's, uh, they're importing it from other areas. The Caribbean was very extensive in exporting bananas for a long time with South America. That's also, we, we just came back from uh, seven, what is it, five island, five islands in the Caribbean, seven days. I'm trying to see if I can do all the, the islands that are in the book so I can learn a little bit more. And each, each time I go to one, they tell us, no, no, that was before. We don't do that anymore. Uh, sugar cane is not a big deal. We still grow it, but it's not as extensive as it was in the past. Uh, coconuts. It's, it's, we used to export lots of it, uh, bananas. You have, you have islands that now don't want to bother doing those items. Coffee, 
it's another. It sits there, the land is there, but they're just not producing it. It's moved to other areas. The Caribbean basically, fruits, sugarcane, some vegetables, uh, but the big deal in the Caribbean is the beaches, tourism, casinos. And that's what's keeping them afloat, not uh, the other uh, food products. Yes. In your research, have you come across uh, the, the, the origin of the word China for oranges? Uh, China. If you, uh, because we, we call the, the color, color naranja yeah. or color anaranjado. But the fruit, we call it, call it China. Yeah. And if this is a slang word. It is, it is naranja. From, yeah, from, yeah, from, but, from the origin. But all the, the uh, three islands it? used to. No, the Santo Domingo and Puerto Rico are the ones who used uh, China. Yeah, but, uh, which, 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 in essence, is China. And exactly. You, know, I, I'm you, you don't say, could I have a China? It was introduced from <laughs> China at what time? You know, that's a that's a good one. I'm gonna look that one up tonight. I, I was I, I was up yes. I was just wondering what the the indigenous fruits and vegetables are for. Potatoes, yams, uh, maize, maize, uh, definitely tobacco. Juca. Uh, juca, to, juca, no. uh, questionable, because yeah. they say that that was brought in from oh. J Root vegetables, in essence. Uh, taro is another one. Taro, taro is a root. It's a malanga. It's a yautia. It's they're not the same, but they're root vegetables, and they're in the same category. And if you look, if you look in the computer, and you see malanga, malanga is called manac. Uh, it's called dashim. Uh, and if you look that up, you'll see. Yautia, which is a taro root, also in that same area. And actually, there's about seven other uh, roots that are also in that same area uh, that, that are in the computer if you look it up. And it, it, can, it can get a little confusing, uh, you know, but Yautia became a big product in Puerto Rico. So did the Malanga. It, it's, it's also in Santo Domingo and in Jamaica, but not in other islands. Other islands, it's, they use the leaf for more so uh, for cooking than the actual root, which is strange. Uh, but that's the way it became with the influence of the Indians, that they would rather uh, prepare a soup or a stew uh, and use the leaf. Where we, we make sancocho, or if we make a serenata, which is bacalao, a salad of bacalao with vegetables, it's nice if you use malaga, yautia, besides potatoes. How about the pastel? Pasteles are just from Puerto Rico, I think. I don't think there no, are no, 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 no. Pasteles, pasteles came from tomales. Uh, they were around way before the Peruvian, the Indians were make the uh, Mexicans were making them. The Puerto Ricans went in another area and made it with other vegetables, bananas extensively. You have an item called conquis that is made, uh, and it's a sweet tomale from the Caribbean. Uh, my friends at uh, Don Coqui, where I teach at, every time November comes around and I start making pasteles, they, they're Mexicans, they come downstairs and they say, Oh, Chef Julio, está haciendo tamales. Tamales, tamales. Tamales, tamales, excuse me. They always they say tamales. Uh, I said to them, no, man, these are pasteles. You know, they're not, they're not tamales or tamales. Uh, but the, the difference in the, in the pasteles is that the masa started out with bananas. And now, today, you have yuca, uh, calabaza, yautia, uh, yame, they're infused in there now. And of course, uh, the meat that goes inside, pork, they're now using chicken. They're, uh, you know, two years ago I came up with a vegetable pastel that's, that I'm um, getting more orders from as time goes on. Uh, people are eating better, they're, hopefully they're still too much on the weight part. 
I remember when I went into the Navy, they, I, I had studied art, photography, and music, and I went in, I, and the officer says to me, what do you do? I said, I'm a musician. We don't need musicians. I'm an artist. I can paint. We don't need artists. I'm a photographer. I can, yeah, we don't need photographers. Ended up on the deck force, chipping and painting the ship. And I was in two two fights. I was in two fights during the first week, and uh, it was brought to uh, what they call a uh, you know, where they, they judge you and everything. Uh, he says to me, "Why are you constantly getting into fights?" I says to him, "Because I have a high school diploma, and I'm in, I'm in these with these idiots chipping paint." I the high school diploma back in 1964 it was a big deal. So he says, no, 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 we don't need, we don't need what, what you brought in. And so I said, well, what do you have available? And he said, food or laundry. So I said, full stomach or a clean uniform? I went with the stomach, as you could see. And it turned out they were, they were both in the same department. So I was sent to school for three months to learn how to cook. You don't learn how to cook in three months. You know, I have uh, I have people that take my three-hour class, and they say, "Could be able to get a job cooking?" No, <laughs> it takes years to be able to become a chef or to be able to learn, learn all the spices and to be able to complete the entire meal. Uh, that was my beginning. Uh, that was back in 1964, a uh, long time ago, uh, and uh, from there I went on and on until I. Uh, became uh, pretty good at it, and uh, I've written two books. That's Dolores behind you there. Uh, she, her first, the first book was called Doll's Kitchen, uh, which is still out there. And this is the second one that came out recently. Do, are there any other questions? Um, could you explain what tubular vegetables are? Vegetables that grow underneath the ground. You can you could say that potatoes are, but not. They're basically roots. They're root vegetables, uh, like what we mentioned earlier, malanga, jautia, uh, potato. potatoes. Potatoes, yeah, but they're root, roots, roots, they're different. They have a circular root pattern, uh, and they're basically a seedling that grows under, under the ground. Yeah, and uh, uh, well, the first time I saw, I said, "We're eating this." You know, my then my mother brought out this malanga that was about this big, and then when she when she cut it open, it looked a lot better. You have the purple and white inside, but this hairy, ugly-looking thing with these circular root patterns, you know, I I just I would never in my mind. What I'm not eating that. Uh, it tastes much better when you cut it. Actually, you can do so many things with malanga. Most of us just simply boil it. Uh, you can fry it, you can stew it, you can bake it. Uh, the same thing with uh, jautia. Uh, we're used to eating uh, root vegetables a certain way, and it's usually boiled. In Asia, they rarely boil it. They basically cut it up and put it into stews or prepare it in different ways. Uh, I was reading up on roti, if you know it, you heard that one, how the Indians brought that over, and it's basically a, a wheat bread that's very easy to make, uh, very, very easy to make, and you, you, uh, it's, it's just a, a little bit of uh, wheat flour, water, uh, and salt, and you, you fry it on a pan, and it's unleavened bread. Uh, you can serve it with chicken, curries, curries of all sorts, but in many cases they'll even use it as a pastry and fill it with sweet items. That's, excuse me, it's, it's the taste buds that they have and the way that they change the food and the flavoring. In Grenada, uh, uh, nutmeg, <coughs> extend you, the air smells like nutmeg if you, if you go to that island. It's the second highest uh, producer of nutmeg in the world. They use it extensively for cooking also, <coughs> making everything from teas to stews uh, with that particular spice. And again, not so much spices were brought into the Asia, Asian world. It was taken from there and spread out throughout the islands. Uh, and 
areas like Africa, uh, Europe. The, the, it wasn't just Britain, it, it was all of Europe that ascended on, on the uh, islands back during that time. 10 million laborers, slaves, were brought to uh, the islands to take over the, uh, not only searching for gold, and it's a good thing that they, they finally discovered Mexico, and they discovered the gold that was in Mexico, and the attention shifted in that direction. Uh, that was during the 1800, seven, seven, late 17th to 1800s. Uh, but a lot of the items that were brought were basically spices, 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 spices. And who was producing these spices? Mostly India, China, uh, Asian, Asian countries uh, producing the spices and selling them to uh, the European nations. And the European nations, again, bringing them to the Caribbean taking out rum. Yes. Um, in your opinion, do you feel that uh, Puerto Rico holds the patent on most Hispanic menus and the other islands have copied off of Puerto Rican menus? I don't mm -hmm. think so. I wouldn't go as far as saying yes to that. I wouldn't say no either, <laughs> but I am not, I'm not totally committed to a yes. Uh, don't nobody throw anything at me for this next thing I'm about to say. But I don't consider Puerto Rican restaurants all bad. The food is excellent. Their restaurants, eh, you know, uh, middle road. Uh, they have very expensive restaurants. They have very inexpensive restaurants. There's very little in the middle. Uh, in, in other countries, you have a, a lot of the middle, very little on top. A lot on the lower part, you know, so it, it's, it changes. The one thing that the islands did was they kept the influence of seafood. Lobsters forever, snapper, uh, is that okay? So you broke something there. Uh, <laughs> lobsters, <laughs> all sorts, all, oh, it's, <laughs> all sorts of fish product. Conch, is that correct? Yes. yes. A lot of the islands have that particular item that they use extensively. And you have to check this out also because I was reading, I was reading last night and today, a lot of these islands, especially when it came to Britain and France and the Netherlands, they, they, there's islands that they fought 14 to 18 times different wars and a country would take over a certain island for 50 to 100 years, and then France would come in again and fight, and they would win, and the British would get kicked out, and they would be there for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. A lot can happen during that time. And, well, the Spanish basically didn't, there's a lot of islands that the Spanish didn't want to bother with, and there was islands that Columbus went by, and he says, oh, that's, that, whatever the name they gave it, that's going to be uh, for the queen and, and king of Spain. They didn't even set foot on the islands to find out you know, what was going on there uh, until many years ago. And, and then the Spanish, when they came, they looked at it and they said, too flat, not enough mountains. Uh, they found the Bahamas to be, you know, that they passed up on it. And so many islands and until later on, the French came and the British looked at it again. and. There was islands like Dominica, which lots of islands that the Caribbean Indians didn't want to give up at all. And they fought, they fought, they fought, and they finally gave it to them. And then they figured out, they figured out, should I finish? Okay, we have to finish. But they figured out years later that those islands were worth going back into and checking out. And what they did, they came back in and they changed the course of history again. Thank you. Look at my videos, and if you wish, we have the book available in 15 minutes or up. I just want to thank um, Nimsa for her invitation and Alberto for allowing me to, to share the story of the Coqueta Masters. I had a PowerPoint presentation. I probably didn't load it, so I'm just going to go through my papers. But I just wanted to show you briefly um, what our uh, logo is. This is our logo that was developed by um, Jose Medina. Uh, of Boricuation, and 
he took my image um, of what I thought I wanted uh, to be branded as the Coquito Masses and the International Coquito Federation um, as a shield, a coat of arms. Um, and inside the coat of arms are the basic ingredients of Coquito, which were um, cinnamon, coconut, vanilla, and then a Puerto Rican flag, but, uh, and rum. But um, I'm gonna be very brief, but I'm gonna be um, talking tonight about, um, I wanna provide a brief history of Coquito Masters, review the structure of the qualifiers and the finals, discuss organizational issues, um, and talk about Coquito Masters 2012 and, behind, and beyond. Um, I think it's important to start with the history of um, Coquito and its evolution and its nomadic ingredients, which was a perfect segue um, coming after um, <coughs> the uh, last speaker because I tried to find what was the origin of Coquito and what I found was um, the earliest distant cousin or great-great-great-grandmother was called Pousset and eggnog, um, and that was from Britain. And then they have rompompe, which is in Mexico. They have boncha cream in Trinidad and, and Tobago. They have creme caramel in Haiti, and pisco in Peru. So it's like, where did Coquito, and how did this happen, and how did these ingredients from all these countries end up in our little island, and how did it end up in that one cup? Um, and I thought it was an important thing to talk about because Coquito is such a core tradition of the Puerto Rican identity. And, and that's how this whole thing started. The Coquito Master's story is not a common one, but it's, it has an uncommon outcome. It started because I lost a friend that made Coquito. And like many of us, we find ourselves losing a generation of people that made the best arroz con pollo, the best pasteles, the best whatever. And we don't take the time to learn how to make it um, because we think that they're gonna be there forever. And, and I think that's a mistake. And I think that um, what Coquito Master's tries to do is to honor the legacy of that particular um, experience and relationship. So it's, it's a common story because um, one of the things that I found in my mother's house, which was really interesting because she's kind of cleaning up her, her books, is um, you know how you have the ancestors, the book, you know, the, the family tree? It was a family tree for your recipes. And it was about what was your grandmother's recipe, what was celebrated on different different holidays. And I think that I'm gonna kind of advocate for that now that every family should sit down and create, you know, you have Ancestry.com, well we should do an AncestryCulinary.com, right? Yeah. So that then you can take the time now and, and get those recipes and follow, you know, that tradition and find out where that actually, or, you know, originated. And you can find out, you know, like my grandmother was from Spain, from Granada, you know, maybe there's a recipe that she could have handed down to me that I can now say that it was from Granada in Spain. So I um, want to advocate for that, encourage you to do that, um, and think about it as a project for Christmas or Thanksgiving or something like that, to sit down and take the time to do that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So it's, this is funny because it goes, my next bullet point is from Sofrito Nuevo tasting to Masters. So what was that? Sofrito Nuevo was actually what I had started originally. Um, and it was soul frito, S-O-U-F-R-I-T-O, because my partner was African-American, and what we had decided to do was to kind of combine um, our talents and start a catering company, and it was called soul frito, right? Um, and we would start doing the tasting, so it was like soul frito tasting, and we did that for a few years, and it was funny because I kept seeing where it was going, and then I had all these images of how to do this, this um this logo and one logo was actually a pilon, right? You know the mortar. The, you ever know what a pilon is? Okay, so it was a pilon <laughs> with an African woman's face uh, inside of it. So that was kind of showing the the diaspora between us, the African American and the Latina. And then the other one was a woman dancing bomba, and her her skirt had rice and beans in it and stuff. So um, it's funny how the whole thing kind of evolved from so soul frito nuevo to Coquito Masters, you know? So what were the core elements of this? The core elements are basically honoring tradition, looking at how we can celebrate Coquito in a way with a level of sophistication because I went to Cordon Bleu Cooking School because I fell in love with the movie Sabrina 
Um, and remember when she went to Paris to forget the guy? Okay. So I knew that I wanted to go to Paris and I wanted to go to cooking school. And, you know, my mother is so, so, so generous. Um, I didn't go to Paris, but I went to Cordoba Cooking School. And, you know, I learned things about how to approach food and the relationship that I have with food. And we did a wine tasting, a lot of different tastings. And I call, I went kind of back to that when I started thinking about this coquito um, journey that I started. And I said, why not think about doing something with this with coquito? You know, because we all celebrate it. It comes out during the season, but then it disappears. But when it comes out, we're so happy. And just saying the word coquito makes people light up. You, know, you can see their eyes say, oh, coquito, oh, you know. So that's, you know, so the core elements are history, the core elements are love, um, honor and tradition. And the outcomes are a celebration and a reverence and respect for the Puerto Rican contribution to the culinary stage. And I think that that's something that is really important because, um, you know, you know mojito, right? You know tequila, um, you have a beer fest in, Ger in Germany, you know, why not have a coquito festival? So, um, in El Barrio, in Paris, and everything else. So, um, so what did I want to do? I started thinking about like doing this coquito thing and, and create these chapters, the International Coquito Tasting Federation. And, you know, I was going to go have a coquito plane and drive, you know, go all over the place. Why not? You know, everybody else does things like that. But it was funny because um, it all started from a loss, you know, and that was when my mother's friend passed away where I was like, oh my God, I have no coquito, nothing, ever, can't find it, don't know how to make it, never watched her. Um, and I had the parties in my house for selfish reasons so that I can get my coquito, right? <laughs> the stash of coquito. Um, and it just grew. And, you know, it, it's just funny how people, it started to get really more serious, you know, like this one guy came to my house and he was like, this is my aunt's coquito, this is my grandmother's coquito, <laughs> you know. And it was like, this is from Ponce, and this is from Mayagüe. And, you know, it was like really crazy, but, you know, it was a good crazy. So, you know, what are the structures of the qualifiers, the finals, and my lessons learned? My first lesson was um, from tasting to the masters. Originally, it was a coquito tasting contest. So that's kind of a mixed message because it's kind of like, we're going to go taste coquito, right? We're going to all, that's all we're going to do is taste. And it wasn't about coquito tasting because people came in thinking about how many can they taste. You know, like I could taste 15 and I could taste 20. And that's not what it was. Um, it was more about a refined, you know, wine tasting, ta you know, ta tasting type thing. But it was like we weren't spitting out. Sorry, we do not spit out coquito. We swallow, it's sacred, and you know, spitting out somebody's coquito is totally, you know, disrespectful. Um, so, you know, it started out tasting and it started out very open. You know, the Museo de Barrio extended an invitation to me. We went there, and the first time that we did it, we put the coquitos out there, we put them on the table, put out cups. And walked away and you know tito was there a few people were there and it was just like open season you know people just like knocking them back knocking them back and i'm like where are the rating sheets you have to fill out the rating sheets but the rating sheets were you know even more complicated you know it was taste it was color consistency kick you know and each one had a um a category and you had to rate from one to ten and you know then we had to t tally all those numbers and that's a whole other thing i'll talk about later um but, you know, so, so then what happened? You know, it went from a tasting free-for-all and it, it evolved into something more, you know. And that's in 2008 when, um, you know, I put out the call. We're doing the Coquito Masters. We're doing co the Coquito Tasting Contest, right? Because remember, that's what, what was being said, the Coquito Tasting Contest. Um, and, you know, you come in at 6 o'clock. And from 6 to 6.15 is registration. And I was sitting there and I saw a whole... A slew of people and I counted and it was 48 people that were bringing in coquito 48 samples of coquito right and the museo was on the renovation so they put us in this little room and the room was this big and then there was art on the wall and you couldn't lean up against the wall so they had people the guards saying don't lean up against the wall right <laughs> and then you had 48 48 <laughs> so it was really great because it was it was mad it was mad they called the police you know they shut down the thing you know people were like knocking on the thing saying no let me in let me in um but 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 you know so as a result of that we had to like step back and think about like okay 
how can we handle this? How can we manage this? How can, you know, I, I, I turned from like, you know, like this person that was doing it to like an administrator, to a contract manager, to a project manager. And I had to apply those things. So we talked about having masters, coquito master qualifiers. Because, you know, I am chef and the food channel and stuff, you know, you get influenced by that. So, you know, in 2008, we, we, we started doing that, and, and that was really interesting because that was another, you know, let's go out there and do tasting, you know, and do these qualifiers. And it was very interesting because I'm so grateful that people, you know, came up and they, they offered to help and they offered to, to be, you know, um, a site, not knowing what we were doing, you know, at all. Uh, yeah, but it was coquito, you know, so I'm buying all the cups and, you know, I'm, I'm searching all the 99 cent stores and I'm, you know, because my first, the first, all the other thing is, um, it, when you first start doing coquito contests, right, you start with big glasses, right? <laughs> and then you learn to go to little glasses, right? Because, you know, that's a lot of, a lot of alcohol, a lot of milk, you know, your stomach gets messed up, people were calling me the next day with hangovers or other gastro <laughs> issues um so you know it's it's all about learning so each time you learn something different so you know we had great times at the museo i have to say they were great you know um it was open season there was lobbying you could run around the room with a bottle and kind of be like yo take taste my coquito you know and it was mad um and i remember one point i got uh, i got a coquito raining sheet with gum inside of it you know because i guess the person decided to take the gum out and put it in the corner and they were going to open it up and eat the gum later but so you know it was like the numbers were all over the place and you know and people were standing in one spot drinking all the coquito you know and, um so you learn that you have to kind of put in some boundaries so now you know, it's so funny because now, you know, I got rules and regulations and we have, you know, registration, what's your site? And, you know, like even with the rules, it's like it, it got a little intense because um, I mean, I have to read this to you because it's kind of like it got really deep. It's like, you know, Coquito Master qualifier rules. You know, the Coquito Master winner from the previous year does not have to compete. They are defending their title. Um, there are various locations throughout the city with a special collaboration with um, other states where they send qualifiers. Um, I started out charging a $25 entry fee because basically this is me running around like a loca. Um, you know, at each event there's going to be 6 to 10, only 6 to 10, not 48. Um, you know, entries are assigned a letter and then, you know, they're put into the... Um, the pictures, we have the same pictures, we have the letters, and it's all done in secret, no one knows. You know, the rating sheets and the voting process will be reviewed. Um, and then it's like, this year, it's like no lobbying, you know, because in some cases, people figured out which one was their coquito, and they were kind of, it's B, it's B. You know, so that was a whole other piece where it's like, if you're lobbying, I'm going to disqualify you, you know. So it's kind of, I've turned into this other um, a taskmaster when I'm trying to have fun, but I do have fun and I love it. I have to say I love it. So right now I'm doing the legal mambo. Right now I am in the middle of trademarking, patenting, copy, copywriting, patenting, copywriting, and trademarking. I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, but, you know, you have to protect your, your stuff. It's, it's intellectual property. It's, it's, you know, friends and family, man, they will kill you, you know. Um, it's, it's, you know, the way of the world. If you, if, you, if you don't claim it, it's not yours to own, you know. So I had to do this whole legal piece. Um, you know, we have waivers. We have people that sign waivers because, you know, we tell them to drink, to taste responsibly, not to drink, you know, to eat, that this is a, a small program. It's not a night of drinking. And the actual qualifier, I have to say, is it's about two hours max. You know, you come in, you explain it, um, people check in. We assign the letters, uh, we put them out, you taste for like 45 minutes, um, and then we go back and we do the tallying, and then in the meantime people are like doing some kind of entertainment or something, then we come back and we make the announcement. So it's a two hour, two and a half hour gig the most. It's not a party. It is a party, but it's not, you know, white body. Como se dicen. Um, so right now where we're at is, you know, we're doing the whole legal thing and we're trying to get that done. So what's the organizational structure and issues? I have to say that I have wonderful partners that have been in the past very supportive. Um, 
you know, people past contestants that have come out, you know, year after year after year. Um, you know, they're, they're here. They're, you know, Tito and Ida and um, Ritz is here. You know, Karma, she's been a host. You know, and then I have regular tasters. And that's the one thing that's hilarious because, you know, it's like, can I taste it one or all of them? I say, no, you can taste it all of them. So you can go around the entire city because there's one in each borough. Um, and that's the interesting thing that each borough has their own coquito qualifier and then that brings a whole level of community you know and in that in that level of community you invite people to come out an elected official you know somebody in the community a leader that you know you want to honor and you know you can be a judge you're going to be a judge next year <laughs> you're already in she's in um you know so it's and it's a whole other thing because you, know, you have to have the popular vote and then after that you know you have the finals where you have the popular vote and then you have the top ones and then you have guest celebrity judges you know and that's a whole nother level of 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 professionalism that i'm trying to add to this because you have you know i've had daisy martinez Filiberto estevez um who says he's my guest chef for life you know because he's the executive um executive chef for gracie mansion he loves coming every year you know and filling it out um so you know i've, I've had great partners in the community um in my family that have put up with my craziness because it's a season of Coquito that starts from September and it goes all the way now. Next year is going to go all the way to like Three Kings Day, you know, and some of the sites that have been um, so helpful have been, you know, Clemente de Soto Velez, Body Equation, they've, they've organized it, Hostos Community College, um, the Caribbean Cultural Center, Museum of the um, Museo de Barrio. So, you know, it's, it's this whole... Um, different place that people come together and and we've had amazing media coverage um you know i've been on npr um i'm actually invited to go to hawaii which is going to be pretty awesome you know because they have puerto ricans in hawaii so um that's going to be interesting um but you know it, it's it's my vision is that you know there's going to be a coquito you know event at every single in every single state in every country you know, there's going to be chapters of the of the International Coquito Federation, you know, and we're going to all converge, you know, and have a Coquito convention, you know. Um, and we're going to have panels, and we're going to talk about, you know, the migratory patterns of the ingredients. And, you know, why not? Um, they do it in Germany, right? So they do it in other countries. Why not have a Coquito, you know, migration with delegates from all over the world? Um, and, you know, I keep telling people, and they think I'm crazy because I say I want to drink Coquito on the Eiffel Tower, and why not? Um, we could do it, you know. And in Australia, what the hell? Um, but, you know, it's, it's not just about that. It's about a, a preservation. It's about, you know, the supporters. It's about the audience, you know, because it's really important that, you know, I'm t that you have a relationship with these people because, you know, we're, we're like a family now. We are like a family. You know, we, we, I, mean, I go to the Bronx and there's this group, and then I go, to, go to Brooklyn, there's this group. This year we had it in a church. That was kind of interesting, I have to say. Because um, I was like, you sure, you, know, gonna, you sure we can bring cookies? He's like, no, it's a really progressive church. So I was like, okay. So, you know, um, it's, it's kind of gotten, um, it's, it goes, it just goes, and I go with it, and, you know, I just psh, fly. Um, but I have to say that, you know, as a result of it, what's the impact? The impact is that people have credibility. They've been given a, a wonderful opportunity to share their talents, to honor their ancestors, our heritage. Um, and, and, you know, the nutritional value is amazing. Um, so, but Coquito Masters, you know, is something that's, that's near and dear to all of us. And, and I'm grateful for everyone that support me in, in, this, in this madness. Um, because it is, it's a whole season, you know, where every weekend we have a qualifier, you know, and then we build up to the finals. And then the finals, everyone comes and they taste and they, you know, we do all this other stuff. And then um, this year actually was the first time, no, last year, it was the first time that we incorporated a coquito crawl, a bar crawl, where, first one in the country, right? <laughs> where we, we, we had a map of El Barrio, a map of El Barrio, and we had different restaurants, and each one had hosted one of the finalists, and then we got the Bronx trolley, right? And then we put coconuts on the map so that people, we gave out maps, you know, um, and people rode the trolley and walked 
all over East Harlem. So it's a tourism thing, right? It's a tourism, culinary destination, um, culinary tourism. And, and, you know, and, and I have to say that, you know, some of the work that I do in the community has helped me to, to think about that because I've, I've been on a lot of boards and, you know, like the Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone, they talked about culinary tourism and, you know, um, well, there's really nothing in East Harlem. And I was like, no, there's a lot in East Harlem, but we just have to cultivate it, you know? Um, and now we have we have a lot of restaurants. We have a lot of things going for us, and and the the restaurant managers loved it. But you know there were some things that get bumps, you know because we learned that we're not going to do the finals in a bar crawl this year. That's not going to work. But we're going to do a bar crawl for Three Kings Day, you know, and have that as a celebration in El Barrio. Um, you know, we, we learned a lot, um, and, and I think the most important thing is being able to um, hear people's concerns, you know, and try and change and evaluate and, and do course corrections. And every year gives me an opportunity to do that, you know. Um, and some people have said, well, you know, what's up with the, you know, you don't have any sponsors, why is it always you? And, you know, I had a, I had a really deep, I had to have a really deep discussion with my own soul about sponsorships because it's kind of like, you know, um, I had some friends that were like, oh, you're selling out Coquito. You know, you're a sellout. You know, you're going to give it up. You're going to give it away if you let the sponsor come in. And I was like, well, you know, I need the money because I'm, you know, the broke. Um, but not only broke, it's like, you know, how do we really use their resources, their marketing resources? And, you know, I had some conversations with some rum companies, and they were like, well, you know, we'll support you if you use only our rum. And it's like, I had to turn that down because I can't tell you to change your recipe, you know, because I want the sponsorship. You know, so we're, I'm still looking at sponsorship, but, you know, I don't have a website. I need help with that. I need help with voting. You know, um, actually, I'm connecting, I'm connecting with some culinary schools where they're going to be serving, you know, like, snap my finger, and they're going to come out. And they're gonna serve, because um, you know I wanna I wanna be able to, um, not relax but really enjoy the moment as well, you know. And I think that it's a level of professionalism when people come out and stuff. So what do I see a coquito convention, a coquito product line? So I have like we have t-shirts. There's a t-shirt floating around and I don't know where it went. It was on a chair. Okay, good. And the other thing is like you know we're gonna think about doing you know. KitchenAid stuff, you know, coquito blenders. Why not? You know, I mean, we're all busy, right? And then, you know, it's like, yo, do you know anybody that has coquito? You know, like, it's like this whole thing. I got to score coquito. And around that time, I, I get calls. I get crazy calls, right? So, you know, what do you do? I say, okay, so what kind of coquito do you like, right? Do you like your creamy coquito? Do you like a cinnamon coquito? You know, and it, it, it's, a, it's really catering to these people's needs because... This year, I also had to, um, you know, you, you, I'm putting together a starter kit, a host kit, you know, training for captains, the whole thing, right? But the other thing was, you know, um, in the course of doing this, you, things happen and people evolve, and so do society. So we've had pistachio coquitos, we've had chocolate coquitos, you know. Um, and then, you know, there's a whole debate. There's purists, there's people that are purists. They're like, no, 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 no. Eso no se hace. Eso no se hace. You know, with this little, this, uh, this little, this, I'm a little lady. But the señora me jaló, you know, and she said, come here. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. She says, ¿y qué es un chocolate con coquito? And I was like, well, but ganó. You know, he won with the number. She says, no, 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 esto no es Starbucks. You know, so so I was like, okay, you know, so so what do you do? So so now we have to have a category for fusion, right? So we have to have a, you know a category for fusion coquito. So you know all this to say, all this to say that you know, um, what are the core elements of coquito? And I, and the core elements are love, you know. And I just want you to share and embrace the love of of coquito and how people. Um, embrace it, celebrate it, honor it. Um, and, and I think the other thing is that Coquito Master serves as a reality check for some people because there's people that think that their Coquito is all that. And they don't really know. They don't know. What really, Coquito is not, you know, I'm going to tell you, I went to an event, and I'm not going to say where, but it was in the East Harlem. Um, I went to an event, and they said, oh, Daddy, mira, here's some Coquito. And it was condensed milk with rum. Condensed milk with rum. 
That is not coquito. Yeah. You know, and then you have the other people that say, oh, it's un coquito de lata. You know, that's made from the can. That's not a coquito. You know, you have to prime el coco and all this other stuff. Oh no, you have to put the coconut in the oven so they can get warm and then you can put, and then you have to use the coconut water. So, you know, it's this whole thing. So, um, all this to say that I'm grateful for all of you. I'm grateful for the people that keep coming back every year, um, competing, perfecting their own coquito because it's a taste test for them. Um, but some observations, um, there are people that, that like the heavy, the heavy rum. You know, there's some people that don't, they just want to be, they want to flavor it. You know, and there's people that like really um, light, watery. You know, and there's people that like it chunky and thick. And then, I know you made a face. I know, I feel the same way. Like, you know, my coquito, my coquito is perfect. It, <laughs> yeah, my coquito is perfect because, because no, because it's, it's the experience of frothiness. It fills your mouth. It doesn't, you know, like hit you. It, it's not heavy with the flavors. You, you know, so, but people's tastes change. So every year, one winner can be a certain way, and then next year, you know, there's another one. So, um, you know, my contact information is Coquito Masters at Gmail. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. Um, you know, we, we sell the jackets, and, and that helps us to buy our little cups. Because the guy goes crazy every time he sees me, and I'm rating his, you know, the little cups. I go and, I, I mean, I really take the whole boxes. What's the 99? The 99 cent store. So the best one is on 3rd Avenue and 108th Street. Because, <laughs> because, you know, after a while, you have to go to all of them. So, you know, I'm putting together proposals and stuff like that. You know, I could always use help. Um, I have qualifier registrations for next year. Um, this year. This year, yeah, but this you know, year. it's like I'm already there. Um, but you know, I just want to say that I'm really grateful um, for this, and and they're, they're they're doing a documentary about this, so this is even more um, exciting. So you know, when we do the screening or whatever, more coquito. <laughs> um, but I'm also thinking about you know doing a whole coquito masters competition, you know, like the masters competition for the grand coquito master, you know, because it's. Because you win the, you, if you're a master, why not have the master's masters? Yes. You know, and then, then it's really on, right? It's, it's really on, so. Yes? Consider uh, Coquito apps. Yes, okay, so here's, all right, here we go. I would love to have help with Coquito apps, and this is one thing that we go through every year, like, Debbie, when are you going to get rid of those damn calculators? Um, yes, I'm thinking about Coquito apps and software and stuff like that. I just, I'm so busy um, in, in it that, you know, we need help. So I'm going to try this year to take a different approach. You know, like I'm not going to be the MC. I'm going to hire somebody, you know, somebody to be the MC, somebody to do the uh, media, somebody else to do, you know, the graphics, the, the whole thing, because it, it needs that now. It really needs that type of management by committee, you know, they advise, and then because it's gotten that, that intense. You know, people try all kind of stuff from their coquito. You know, you don't you'd be amazed what's in coquito. Um, really. But but it's it I, but it comes from a place of love and it comes from a place of this is my family and this is the way that we do it. You know, so um, when you go to someone's house, you know, you have coquito, they go out the window or they go under the cabinet, you know, it's there. Um, and what I'm trying to do is to bring coquito to light, you know. So you had a question? Yeah. Um, have you been confronted with entrants to your contest who are Puerto Rican? Yeah, I've had I've had some people that are not Puerto Rican, um, but they they love coquito. Right. And, and, and I'm just thinking like my, my brother's wife is Peruvian and she's trying to like you know through my mother and our family right. get all the Puerto Rican recipes she possibly can because she loves it all and she started making coquito and I just wonder like if that's I don't know. You know, I, I don't think so. I don't think it sh I don't think we should get that no. divisive. I think it's about you coming and honoring us. Were you trying to make the coquito? I think when we start talking about, you know, chocolate, strawberry, yeah, that's you know, that's a whole nother level of coquito. But then there's people that you know, like one when we first did it in my house, it was so funny because um, we gave honorable mention to this one woman because she put brandy in her coquito. She got it off the internet. 
the recipe. So I was like, oh, look, technical cojito, whatever. You know, so it's, it's I don't think that I would want to do that. I think that would be insulting if I was like, oh, this is a non-Puerto Rican cojito entry. Because I think that's not appropriate. You know, I mean, and I, I would welcome that. You know, I would welcome the diversity of, of in fact, in fact, we were supposed to have an Italian coquito um, entry last year, um, but she didn't make it. From the woman that owns Patio de Oro, um, the restaurant, she was going to put in an Italian coquito. So, you know, and then we have political coquitos because we have coquitos <laughs> from elected officials, and that's a little, you know. Yeah, that's a whole different story. <laughs> yeah, it's a whole category, but it's a fun one because it's, it's nice to say, no, your coquito sucks. <laughs> you know, or not, or not. You know, but it, but the it's funny thing is that, you know, there's some elected officials that have gone, they've come in, they've won. You know, some don't come in, and then some come in, but they come in on the aliases. So there's been many instances where we've had elected officials, but they're on the download, you know, with Coquito. So um, <laughs> I just want to clarify that, and, and I just want to be um, very, very humble in my appreciation, because I am very appreciative of, of everything that people do for this. Thank you.